everybody, and welcome to Ed Focus by the Network of Education Policy Centers. My name is Raffaella, and today our guest is Mikhailo Milovanovic from the Center of Applied Policy and Integrity from Bulgaria. Uh, Mikhailo, welcome. Nice is this you. your second, third discussion about integrity? How many times we have met <laughs> so far regarding this issue? Several. Well, okay, and the topic. <clears throat> Uh, the topic is school admission. Uh, Network of Education Policy Centers and the Center for Applied Policy and Integrity recently published an issue paper uh, called Mapping of Policy Practices and Integrity in School Admissions in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Mikhailo Milovanovic and Teodora Christova from the Center of Applied Policy and Integrity authored uh, this, this paper. And we today met with, the, with, with Mikhailo to discuss a little bit uh, about this issue paper that is available in the publication section of the um, network web page, uh, edupolicy.net. So the main aim of this uh, issue paper was to identify areas of tentative risks in the school admission uh, uh, procedures in the, those four countries. And we had somehow several uh, steps of preparation, uh, including uh, scanning, of course, of the of the current uh, policies and procedures, but also discussion with educational experts from from those countries, uh, from uh, NEPT uh, members, and those were uh, the Education Policy Department of International Scientific Educational Center of the National Academy of Sciences from Armenia. Uh, the Center for Innovation in Education from Azerbaijan, the International Institute of Education Policy, Planning and Management from uh, Georgia, and the Foundation for Education Initiative Supports uh, from Kyrgyzstan. So, uh, what we have, Mikhailo, learned so far about the integrity risks in education is that our premise is somehow is that whenever we have uh, some policy gap, or some policy issues, this might open the uh, opportunity for integrity for integrity risks. So let's start from the policy uh, perspectives. How the school admissions is uh, uh, regulated in these countries, uh, and what are the main features uh, of it? Thanks. I'm, I'm happy to be here, and thanks for the opportunity to do this uh, work with you. I think it's a very important area because in a way uh, you have this kind of two layers one is when you read the regulations um, and, and they all sound you know they're written with a good intention in mind you, you never write a law or a rule uh, with the intention to harm anyone on purpose usually you don't and you know, in, in these countries if you read how things are set up you know it is about providing uh, opportunities for all students irrespective of where they come from it is about providing a good quality education it is providing a free of charge education and so on and so on when you then dig a little bit deeper and you try to to sort of uh, organize this uh, this promises into how they translate into you know into the rules and practice in all four countries different as they are it is interesting that you know, they're actually highly selective uh, when it comes to academic performance. So although education should be available for everyone, if we talk about good quality education or what is perceived as good quality education, this is where it starts to get a little bit uh, tricky. So all of these four schooling systems, based on the information we received from, from our partners from the countries, they're really highly selective on the basis of academic performance. And however, they, they, they differ in the way they, they implement this uh, selectivity in, in practice. For example, in some countries, so Armenia and, and, and Kyrgyzstan, you have selection which is based solely on the results of the classroom assessments. So whatever grades you receive in school, this is pretty much the only thing that's decisive. In other countries, the other two, Azerbaijan uh, and Georgia, you have certain types of schools, specialized schools, for example, also schools which are, you know, for example, schools for talented children, schools with um, uh, in-depth uh, teaching of uh, foreign language and so on, they're actually allowed to administer their own admission tests in the forms of uh, tests uh, and interviews. And so in theory, you have this kind of uh, two, uh, two tires. One is, you know, access to schools, which for one reason or another, they are competitive or elite. 
uh, and, and access to all the rest. And it's quite an interesting phenomenon um, is to see that indeed when it comes to uh, the promise to provide a place in a school for everyone, I think all countries are doing quite well. I mean, you don't really have children who are left out because there is no place in school. However, you have this kind of a, you know, on one hand, you have this kind of a broad, doors open. You know, if you want access to the education system as such, no problem. You, somehow you can, you can access, except if you are in one of these categories which are really um, uh, disadvantaged uh, in terms of additional needs or and so on. But for most people, access is really okay. Then you have on the other end this other extreme where, where it is access to really to good education, to education which gives you a chance to progress further in the system, which gives you a chance to have the best teachers uh, and so on and so on. There it is really competitive um, and this is like, you know, I won't say two class society, but really there is a big difference between between um, the approach to admission between these two groups and also in, in the way practices around admissions are being shaped. Um, so, but yes, uh, the schooling, the admission systems in these countries, they are similar in this way, but they're very different in the approach of how, how they actually are, are handling this. In some cases, you may have exams, which are permissible. In other cases, no exams are allowed, but uh, only the grades uh, really, really count. Um, yeah, I'll stop here because the question was quite clear and uh, I want to yeah. avoid the entire study in response to the first question. <laughs> to the first question, yes. Uh, uh, th thank you. Uh, this seems to be uh, the, the issue we should deal with, like the access is somehow uh, guaranteed, but now we have to define what a good education. Uh, we have to ensure access to good education. And also, it's very interesting what, what you mentioned that actually uh, the perception of good education, uh, which somehow we will discuss a little bit a little bit later. Um, according to the uh, issue paper, uh, you have identified uh, uh, four, let's say, areas of concerns. <laughs> and those four areas are financial resources and informal responses, uh, network planning and capacity shortages, selectivity in public education, so elite and ordinary schools, and let's say broadly uh, digitalization in, uh, in education. Uh, so um, can you please just define these four areas of concerns, what, what you meant by, uh, by them? So the first one is financial resources and informal responses. <laughs> So basically, the idea is that uh, you know it's 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 an old story. It's an evergreen that there is not enough money in education, and when we look in these countries, there is there is also proof that yeah, resources are never never enough. Now this doesn't mean necessarily the countries don't invest enough of their uh, overall national wealth. It just means that perhaps the resources don't go where they're most. Needed. So it's both about shortage of resources and about uh, about the way resources are being allocated within within the system. Uh, the point is here that schools have every reason to to try and, and compensate for some of the gaps uh, that they have or that they perceive to have. And so in, in doing so, of course, they, they count on partners, external partners. And unlike in maybe some other countries where external partners are institutions and where this cooperation is formalized through some sort of uh, sponsorship agreements and whatnot, in, in these four countries, uh, these external partners very often are, of course, the parents who, uh, not out of any bad intention, they actually are very willing to, to help in any way they can. And sometimes, uh, you know, there is this kind of a line that is being crossed where, uh, you know, you, you actually must commit to helping if you want to have a chance to access the school. This, of course, is a very broad statement, and there are a lot of differences between countries of how this plays out. Uh, in some countries, it's almost impossible now to, to do this. For example, Kyrgyzstan, they have completely removed uh, the, the possibility for schools to interfere in the decisions around admission. And so extorting money from parents is not necessarily guaranteed that your kid will go uh, to that school. But the point is that this kind of a shortage of resources that exists, uh, combined with the wish of parents to send their kids not just to education, as the law stipulates, but to send them to the best education possible. This is really a combination which has been around for a while and which creates both opportunities and incentives to use this sort of uh, support that is required, that schools perceive they require, to use it uh, in exchange for, for, you know, for 
giving admission to, to certain to certain students or others. There's really really nothing new there, and this is really something in the context that you know you can read it in almost every report, but it's still there. And since this is the latest report we did, we thought we must repeat it once again. There is an issue with that, and it won't be solved just by investing more money. Uh, it is really about how how exactly this cooperation is shaped, what partnerships there can be. How do you ensure that these donations are made transparent and that regulated properly and so on? This is also in focus of the other paper we, we had a chance to do with you, as remember, for uh, the Global Education Monitoring Report on, on the role of private mm -hmm. actors. So if you want to know more about that, uh, yeah, it's, it's somewhere there. About the network planning capacity shortages, this is an area where uh, the question is, do we have uh, the kind of enrollment capacity where it's most needed? And you have this phenomenon where uh, the question, the decision of where schools are being built and how big they are, they're either historic decisions, so you've built a school 50 years ago and then you never really came mm. back to that anymore, or very often you have situations in which there are new districts emerging from the city. So it's more of an urban problem, really, where, where we have a shortage of enrollment capacity and, and this means it creates really a bottlenecks. And there, of course, you have the, it's kind of a risky combination of shortage of places and incentives and reasons to try to get to a particular school that might not have enough enrollment capacity. And so this network planning capacity shortages, the question is, you know, how did we get there? What can we do? And, and, and this is an area where uh, uh, the way decisions are taken, what schools to build and where, it's not always based on, on evidence. It's not always demand oriented. Sometimes it's, like I said, historic. Sometimes it's a political decision. You know, when a politician gets elected, he wants to build a school. This is like, there is a very nice photo opportunity always, you know. Um, and sometimes there's simply no, no reliable data. You know, the data about demography, about migration, internal migration and so on that countries have is not always really reliable enough. So sometimes I think that those who decide where to build a new school don't even know properly where, where, where a new school is really needed. Uh, this again, a very broad statement. Countries differ uh, a lot uh, between each other and in some countries this might be a bigger problem than in others, but this is like the question. If you have integrity risks because there are not enough places in a given school, you know, the question is, could we have maybe built a bigger school? And next time we, we have a new settlement in the city, uh, can we maybe plan it better and have both a kindergarten and the school planned right along with that? And it's surprising how little we know about this decision-making process and how do they decide where to build, where to expand, and so on and so on. The third one is about this selectivity in public education. I mean, the question, the fact that in these schools, which are, you know, in these education systems, which are by design supposed to be egalitarian, you have this kind of uh, islands of elitism and exclusivity, for good reason, perhaps. I, I really don't try to argue against excellence, per se. But this also creates an example to follow for many other schools, so for many other for parents as well, schools that may not have this kind of elite status but want to emulate uh, this in order to attract more students, in order to attract more funding, if you wish, both official and unofficial. So there is a situation in which you have the elite schools where you have this sort of a competition for places and you have a range of other schools which either want to emulate these elite schools or they think, okay, if I already have an oversupply of students but I'm not allowed to have any kind of admission exam, what do I do? How do I manage, you know, this, you know, too many candidates for too little places? So there is kind of a tendency to start copying what, what the elite mm -hmm. schools would try to emulate the tests and so on. And this is sometimes not really working well because to create a good admission test, to create a fair admission process, really it requires, uh, you know, effort, knowledge, a degree of transparency and so on and so on. This brings us to another problem in this area. It is that actually there is no objective information about how good schools really are. So in this kind of information vacuum, um, uh, you have you have really a lot of hearsay. So sometimes you know parents may just believe this school is better than others, and this creates really a lot of pressure on that school to manage uh, an admission process which has never been designed for that. And so this is really an integrity risk. Really, it creates uh, it creates situations in which institutions and the leadership institutions which were never put in place to, to handle this kind of admission problems, they have to somehow handle them and uh, you know it, it's really a very, not a very good uh, situation. And, and finally, uh, this is really a point that we can probably spend the whole conversation about that. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention that one of the commonalities in all countries is they have all introduced electronic queuing systems uh, for managing the admissions. 
in an effort to uh, you know strengthen the integrity of the process uh, reduce risks uh, make everything more transparent and, and plus it's modern right it's digital uh, it's a good thing to have and so often uh, when we had this question of how is it working you have the answer we have solved everything because we have the electronic e-cleaning systems uh, it was a topic that was of really interest to all countries participating in this because it looks like they have both benefits and certain disadvantages this system first they there are some technical issues there still some scalability problems second uh, um, now these the, the systems in fact they probably remove the possibility to take decisions about admission on school level but they just delegate them further so if you want to bribe somebody for access instead of bribing the principal now you need to bribe the person in the regional education department uh, so what i'm trying to say is i mean well, we can read in the issues paper all the issues around the electronic systems which could be which could be discussed but it doesn't seem to be a panacea it's a step in the right direction but but it is dangerous to think that now that we have the system everything is solved uh, there is there is more to it and it's really an area that, that deserves um, um you know closer attention uh, because it's like part of the bigger digitalization drive it's important to have it but this is just an instrument so if you have problems there they're probably still out there somewhere and, and so it's really an area where, 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 where we need. and there are also vectors of risks uh, around that which we have also described in the paper uh but if i tell you about this probably nobody's going to read the paper so i'm not going to say it. so go, go and read it's not that long it's just uh, 20 pages yeah and, and 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 as we can see from uh, from what you have said so far it's it's really uh, it's really an interesting, an interesting reading uh, that combine old issues, uh, uh, some new one or old issues with uh, new uh, nuances. Uh, during your uh, um, uh, definition of these uh, of these uh, uh, issues, you have mentioned several times uh, the parental uh, position towards towards them, um, and and uh, and. General, one of the aim of this issue uh, paper was to identify which areas we would like to explore uh, further, and the area that you has uh, that you have identified as a transversal dimension of all these issues is the parental perspective and uh, and perception. Uh, let's elaborate a little bit more. Why? Yeah. Um, yes, like you said, one of the most obvious reasons to to include the parents, because the, the purpose of the issues paper was to, yes, scan the landscape, open a, a conversation, and then and then see what could be areas that, that merit a follow-up, if countries are interested. So this is not a research paper per se, it is not a paper that says it all. And also, of course, there's much more than one could do in terms of analysis and the, the detail and evidence. So really, the whole paper actually leads to this sort of final uh, point, which is if you want to do something in this area, what are the areas where you could sort of look closer? And so one of the reasons to look into parents is because, yeah, well, they're involved in everything. If you talk about integrity, for example, of course, you always must have somebody who is the gatekeeper in an official position who is able to provide some some education deliverable to those who do something in return and if we talk about school education those who do something in return are more often the parents and not among the students if you talk about university education parents are less important perhaps in these transactions around around the integrity violations but in school education they are and the category of parents is kind of interesting because it is, in fact, it is between worlds. So it's not part of the formal education system. So once you do research and you have the blessing of the ministry or whoever to go and investigate this, especially in sensitive areas like these, uh, you, you, this does not really concern the parents much. They might come or they may be, they won't come uh, to you. So they are both part of, they're both education participants and they're not. And so, in some ways, the, the, the way parents were always included in this research, the way we know about their perspective, is quite often through, through surveys. Um, but the disadvantage of the service is you can ask a limited number of questions. So it's kind of a conversation with parents around all issues that are important. It's not that easy. And I think that there is still, we have a lot of deficits, especially if we now, through an issues paper like this one, through the integrity research we have done together for the past, what, uh, two years or so, we know that we could have asked some of the questions 
differently because these people are part of all of it. Without them, you, you will, we will not be able to have a functioning system. You will, they're involved. I know that we all talked about we need to have formal ways to involve the parents in the school life. I think they're much more involved than we perhaps uh, have documented. And so in the light of what we know, also through this issues paper, maybe it's time to go back to them with a more informed set of questions. And because with parents, you have uh, only a few shots. They're there for half an hour, one hour. If you're very lucky, they might stay through the entire focus group, but maybe not. So if we have this limited time with them and they're busy doing other things, let's maybe ask them the right questions. And so this is one of the reasons why this parental perspective is important, because now I think we have a chance to ask them the questions which, which really matter. Um, besides, uh, work with parents, surveys, uh, the research with parents, we don't do this every day. And I think the last time uh, this was done, also in the context of our countries, in the context of this integrity work, I think was some time ago, a year, or two, maybe three. So perhaps it's time to go back again to this and, and give it another try. But yes, uh, if you have to summarize why parents are important beyond the uh, you know common sense, yeah, parents are important, we know everybody's important. Uh, it is because in all of these transactions, in all of these areas of risk, in all of these violations that we see might be happening, they participate in that. They are part of the yeah. community now there. And so it's interesting to understand why. We think we know, but maybe we don't. So it would be good to, to actually ask them what is happening and why do they think the chances of getting what they need from the education system are higher if they engage in informal transactions. I think it's very yeah. interesting yeah yeah this question why might might be crucial to understand uh, where their perception uh, uh, come from and also from our previous research we know that there are some schools in some of our countries that would cannot uh, function without the parental contribution and the parental involvement uh, so yes this this might be a crucial a crucial a crucial perspectives that somehow remind us how 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 important is the dialogue among all the stakeholders in the in the public in the public sphere? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mikhail, for this uh, uh, short uh, introduction on the issue paper. As I said at the beginning, the issue paper is available in our uh, website, edupolis.net, in the uh, publication section. Uh, and I really hope that we will have another Edu Focus uh, regarding this uh, parental involvement that we are going to have uh, uh, the follow the follow up. Uh, until then, thank you, Mikhail. Thank you to the Center for Applied Policy and uh, and Integrity for um, keeping the integrity uh, topic uh, uh, high uh, in our in our in our network. And thank you everybody for listening to us and have a nice day and see you at the next Edu Focus. Thank you, Mikhail. Bye. Thanks a lot.